Precious Lord, give me inspiration and grace that my words may not be my hollow words, that we all may be touched by your Holy Scripture. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here we go, here we go. Yeah, I know I want to be very careful about what I say about these reading glasses. I leave them around all over the place. And people keep saying to me, oh, we'll have the ones on the string. Well, <laughs> I have to be careful because in my mind that means something very particular. <laughs> in Are You Being Served, when I was growing up, <laughs> Mr. Humphrey always had glasses on a string. So will I embrace old Queenery or will I not? Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to because I've got about five pairs of them lying around somewhere. <laughs> Projection onto them, there's nothing wrong with having them in a string round your neck. Okay. <laughs> I will embrace my inner Mr. Humphreys. <laughs> which my mother would have said is pretty much an outer Mr. Humphreys after all. <laughs> oh dear, dear, dear. We have a feast in scripture today. Sometimes the lectionary uh, deals you a pack of cards which are really difficult to decipher. Um, and sometimes they concentrate an enormous amount of meat in one place. Um, and today is one of those days. And it's hard to know which direction to go in, so I'll go in all directions. <laughs> Wisdom is one of the themes underlying our scripture today. There's usually an iteration between the uh, Old Testament reading there and the epistle, the first New Testament reading. Uh, and the gospel will often stand alone um, if there's not an overriding theme, and that's what we see today. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. And indeed, wisdom is related to this uh, pre-Christian concept of Sophia, as in the, um, uh, the spirit of wisdom. It is the precursor of what we think of and what we have in our expressed theology as the Holy Spirit. And it's a, a feminine principle, as I think I've said before from this pulpit. The Greek word for the Holy Spirit for um, uh, pneuma is a feminine word. Mm -hmm. um, and this is often overlooked. This isn't remembered. But it's important simply because um, the way the Bible has been expressed over the centuries has been so heavily patriarchal that from a female point of view it's almost impossible to see oneself in it. The truth is, the truth is that God is gender free in all genders. <coughs> and that men and women and intersexed people can see themselves in scripture just as much as anybody else. On occasions more. Yep. The entire life story of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, was made possible because of several very peculiar women. Very peculiar women. If you look at the genealogy of Jesus uh, at the beginning of the New Testament, uh, you will see that uh, a prostitute is mentioned there. Uh, a woman who uh, <coughs> behaved very, very strangely with her father-in-law. Mary, who in some ways was a very peculiar woman indeed, as a teenage girl saying yes to God and risking everything, that's peculiar behavior. So wisdom is again this feminine principle which underpins a lot of the Old Testament and carries through into the New Testament. In wisdom we see the great thing that human beings are expected to strive after. Not riches, not gold, not all those things, just wisdom. Because without wisdom, everything else is bankrupt. Everything else is worthless. <laughs> wisdom cannot be taught. At best, we can point towards it and hope that somebody goes in that direction after many, many miles of their life journey and many things that they have to jump through. You know, it mentions in Proverbs the seven pillars of wisdom. It might be useful to look at what they are. It's not often mentioned in modern day Christianity, but it was very important for those who went before us in the faith and in the Jewish faith that preceded us. These are the seven pillars of wisdom. Prudence, knowledge, discretion, counsel, sound judgment, understanding, and power. Some pick those a bit, because some of them sound like they're the same thing. It's always a problem when you come to translate from another language where the mindset is different. Prudence, 
conservation of supply and sound investment in future supply. That's one way of describing prudence, especially as we would understand it as householders. At its most basic, it's making, enough, you've, making sure you've got enough wood for the winter and making sure that you've planted enough trees so that you will have wood for the winter in the future. That is prudence in a very basic form. Knowledge, attaining enough information to make sound judgment. Wisdom is hobbled by ignorance. Wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing, but one feeds into the other. Discretion, this is a good one. This is one of the seven pillars of wisdom that I struggle with most. Knowing when to speak and when to be silent. <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> counsel. Counsel. The ability to convey and receive advice. And humility is bound up in this quality, in this pillar of wisdom. Knowing when to listen to somebody knowing when to receive from somebody who has greater wisdom, greater experience, greater knowledge. It's this one who's got me out of some nasty scrapes in the past, at the price of a little bit of embarrassment and having to swallow my pride. I still don't do it as much as I should do, but it's a blessed relief when you do do it. Sound judgment. Well, there's an old word which we've often used in American literature of a certain age, perspicacity. Perspicacity, that's a good word. Discernment, that's another good word. Vital for wisdom. One of the signs that wisdom has been achieved and one of the ways in which we may <laughs> further pursue wisdom. Perspicacity and discernment, that's a difficult one. Understanding, comprehending the meaning behind facts and being able to read the lives of self and others. Understanding. Reading between the lines. Knowing what is at the foundation of things. Seeing what is the cause behind the symptoms. We are very fond, all of us are very fond of just reading symptoms. Other people's, of course. We can generally discern our own causes to a degree, but other people, we look at their outward behavior. That's symptoms. Wisdom calls us to look behind their outward behavior and ask, why are they doing this? What has happened to them that they are doing this? What is cleaning them that they do this? What does this mean to them? What do they think they're doing? All these hard questions which are really troublesome because all of us, all of us find it easier to look at our opponents and especially as we're coming up towards an election, it's desperately easy to look at our opponents and uh, demonize them, mm -hmm. to judge them entirely by their behavior. I do it several times a day. <laughs> Wisdom calls us to look behind that, to try and seek that common ground that you might find on a very profound and deep level, to find reasons that maybe the person who's acting out doesn't even know themselves. If you know better, you're expected to do better. And if you know better, you are expected to act on the fact that you know better. If you know somebody has a history which has broken and injured them, we are expected to show understanding. We are expected to act on our inner knowledge. We're expected to show wisdom. Finally, a really difficult one, power. Where does power come in when it comes to wisdom? Well, it's the ability to act. It's where wisdom fails to be passive and becomes active. It also means the leadership bestowed by wisdom. That when wisdom is gained, wisdom is often visible. Wisdom is something which is profoundly attractive to other people. We don't always know what it is that we can't always put our finger on what it is about another person that makes them attractive to us. I don't mean on a superficial basis. I don't mean in dating terms. I mean, you know, you meet some people and they just give off something. Before I was ordained, uh, we had a week's retreat at Alton Abbey in uh, Berkshire in England. And Alton Abbey is a very beautiful place. 
It's surrounded by these uh, gorgeous rose gardens, old roses, uh, with mixed planting and beautiful box hedges and draped in green everywhere, and the woodlands starting on the edge of the abbey. Um, and you meet all the brothers, and they're interesting people, you know, and often very challenging people. You know, this idea that monks are all have found all the answers and are, are living in their monastery in this kind of blissful state is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. Monasteries can be very challenging places. The monks are often deeply challenging people because they are people and they are seeking to uh, interact with the reality of being people. So we met all those monks, and some of them were very eccentric uh, and, and wonderful people. They did religious retreats on uh, Jane Austen and, um, and oh, that's uh, slightly peculiar to my mind, but then again, if you're into Jane Austen, there you go. But then I met the Albert, and the Albert was one of those men who had a presence, not plain charisma, not a pop star presence, a very quiet presence. He had about him a wisdom that was deeply reassuring, but also profoundly attractive. You felt that you could have spent time with the abbot and become a better person. The abbot was a bit like art and travel, you know, those things which you do them and it makes you better even though it doesn't take enormous effort on your part. Just being around this man and listening to this man's speech bettered me. And that was the first time I glimpsed wisdom almost as a tangible, physical presence. And wisdom like that is about the most precious thing that we can crave on this earth. You know, there is depending on what part of the church you come from. Either a single path to salvation and wisdom, or there is a double path to salvation or wisdom, or if you are a terrible heretic, like me, and I was told I was a shocking heretic by a friend of mine in London last week because of my sermon, there is a fourfold path. This one's for you, David. <laughs> the fourfold path to wisdom and the bedrock of a living faith is scripture, tradition, revelation, and reason. One can't be free without the others. And these four prevent us from losing wisdom and flattering merely our own desires. Yes, even the desire for ease and security. It should be noted here that when I say reason, I don't give it extra weight to anything else. And when I say tradition, I don't give it extra weight. And when I say scripture, I don't give it extra weight because they are all from the same wellspring. A fundamentalist Protestant would say, so does scripture, it's only the Bible. A Catholic would tell you, yes, all things necessary are in the Bible, but when it comes to the practical outworking of that, we get ourselves in a horrible pickle if there isn't tradition to guide us as well. And then there's revelation. There's that feeling on top of that that we often in MCC and churches like UCC passionately believe that God hasn't finished speaking. That God cannot be told to shut up retroactively 2,000 years ago that he didn't shut back with the Bible, that God can still speak. That's where revelation comes in, guided by scripture and tradition, as scripture is guided by tradition and revelation. And finally, the bit that makes me a heretic is reason. Although in reality, it doesn't make me a heretic at all. It's been uh, accepted by many people over the centuries that reason is the vital fourth pillar. John Calvin said that when you read something in the Bible which you know to be blatantly inaccurate or just plain wrong, it means it must be allegorical. He accepted that you would come across things which were a product of their time and the understanding of the people that wrote them, or were richly allegorical and weren't meant to be taken literal. <laughs> So reason has been there for a long time, but people have been very uncomfortable about adding reason. Well, I don't know why, because tradition's problematic as well. Which tradition? Yeah. 
Yes. Which branch of Catholicism? What about the Orthodox Church? What about all the different Orthodox Churches? The traditions that have been there for a very long time that have profoundly differing interpretations of Scripture in it. Who's it to be? And if sola scriptura, if only scripture, well, it's not really ever only scripture, is it? It's whoever interpreted that scripture for you. Whichever means of interpretation you are going to employ, because there are lots of different ways of reading the Bible, as we all know. So I would urge that wisdom lies in those four. All four of them. We're not called to sit on the sofa, metaphorically, watching TV, watching the news come on, and nodding our heads sagely all the time. We are called to be newsmakers ourselves. We are called to be journalists. We're called to get out there and start writing the book. The book did not end 2,000 years ago. There is space in that book for your writing. There is space in that book for my writing. That book is not just to make us feel fulfilled. Oh, we've written in it. Someone else may find life in what you've written. Somebody else may find salvation in what you've written. You may be the difference between joy and misery for another human being. Therefore, it is not enough to sit and watch it. We must pursue it, and we must testify, give testimony to our faith journey, and we must write the book ourselves. Our bit may be the most interesting bit. The likelihood is that for us, it will be. Well, I didn't write that in my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> so I've lost where I am now. <laughs> I think I'll leave the bit on entropy for another time. Reasoning. Yes, we got the reason bit. I just wanted to touch on Ephesians. Because sometimes you see the main thrust of your sermon, but there's bits dropped into scripture which have been read out in the church, which you think, well, if I don't at least mention that, somebody's going to be going away and it's going to be turning over in their head, and it can be a real stumbling block. I'm not suggesting I have all the answers. God knows. <laughs> but in Ephesians, it says, be careful how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. Well, we see we're called to wisdom, you know? But being called to wisdom is all very well, you know, getting it is the business, and it can take a whole life, and it often takes a whole bunch of mistakes. You know, wisdom is built out of error. Wisdom is built out of disaster. There's generally not an easy way to achieve it. The road to wisdom is filled with train wrecks. My road to what little wisdom I have has been bought at colossal cost. Make the most of your time, because the days are evil. Now by that, it does not mean that we are surrounded by evil people and we have to be careful. What I'm saying is, the days, the environment, the culture will seek to attract and divert you. It will seek to lie to you. It will seek to tell you that this is how you find joy and fulfillment. It's here, and it'll cost you $300 a month. Well, that's dangerous words because it's easy to believe it when the entire society is plunging into it. But do not be distracted. Make the most of your time because the days are evil. Now the next part is not a list of those things the Almighty doesn't like. It's a rhetorical tool contrasting boozing with being filled with the Spirit. Bear in mind that when uh, the disciples first received the Holy Spirit, everyone said they were drunk. They were filled with new wine. So, you know, this, this matters. There's a reason why there's this balanced metaphor. It's not just God saying, don't drink, it's wicked. Well, that's challenging on a couple of levels, partly because Christ's first miracle, uh, you know, was at Cana and Galilee, the turning of water into wine. I don't drink. I'm teetotal, pretty much. But, you know, it's easy for me to be teetotal. I'm not, I'm not attracted to drinking, so it's no virtue, is it? You know? Oh. I wish, I wish many of us would, would, would give that some thought, you know. Most of what we denounce as being sin in others are things we're not really called to do ourselves. We're not really tempted, you know. Most people do what they want, and whatever they don't want, they describe as vice. Um, <laughs> you know. That's pretty much human nature, isn't it, you know? To think 
that it's possible that maybe it's not vice, it's just different. Yeah. Maybe it's just not what you want. Yeah. The biggest problems come when people desperately do want something, they feel they can't undertake it, and then they get really bitter about it. And they go on enormous campaigns against it. You know, goodness knows, we see politics is full of that. All those anti-gay campaigners, for goodness sakes, come on. You just have to wait a while. And they're found in a bathroom somewhere. <laughs> I know this may seem flippant, but it's true, amen. Yeah. Oh, I mean, think the lady enough protests too much. But after however many decades we've been seeing this happen on a regular basis, you'd think they would have twigged that it doesn't work. You just draw attention to yourself kicking up all that fuss. Like certain lady politicians' husbands, I could mention, but I'm not going to mention because I'm not <laughs>